If you're still finding your way, that's good. Or even if you've got it all figured out, that's I want to hear what you've got to say. That's good. It's Barrage with Toro. Hey folks, welcome to another episode of Bullish with Toro. I'm coming to you live from the sunny island of Barbados, where I've been since after Christmas and where I'm probably going to stay for as long as possible at this point. Um, This episode was recorded in December, pre the Capitol insurrection and the inauguration of Joe Biden is nigh. Tensions have been high, emotions are all over the place, and I really actually want to take a moment to do a little mental health check. So... How are you? I've been tired. I've been upset. I've been confused. I've been amazed. I've been all over the map. And I'm very fortunate to be getting a good amount of vitamin D during this time in history. Here, I'm interviewing my friend, chess tutor, writer, and actor, Luca Glinsky. We talk about his homeschooling, his writing exercises, and geek out about chess quite a bit. Bullish is hopeful or confident that something or someone will be successful. Optimistic about the future of something or someone. So let's get bullish for Luca Glinsky. And I'll throw in for ourselves and the country too. Here we go. Hello, everyone, and welcome to another episode of Bullish with Toro. This is Toro. And I'm here today with Luca Glinsky. Hello, Luca. <laughs> We've just been um, um, giggling before we joined this episode, so we're in high spirits. How are you? I'm doing very well. Thank you. Luca, do you know why I asked you to be on this podcast today? Tell me. Well, because you're super cool. Thank you. <laughs> Actually, well, you were on the short list. Um, back in April slash May when I first started devising this. And I just thought you'd be pretty interesting because, you know, you went to Carnegie Mellon as an actor, you came to New York City, and you've worked in the restaurant business, as many people do. Um, But also, you're kind of like a whiskey connoisseur. Is that fair to say? Yes, an amateur connoisseur, which I guess is, yeah. (laughs) Okay, an amateur whiskey connoisseur, bourbon. Uh, well, scotch is my main, but but really, it's all types of whiskey. You hear him? See, see what I'm talking about? <laughs> <laughs> and also, you teach chess. You teach chess to kids. Well, yes. Well, actually, I up until very recently uh, taught chess to kids, uh, but I still I still do uh, a bit of teaching with uh, with chess. It's now just primarily with adult students. So. Adult students. Adult students. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Well, before we get into all of that, mm-hmm. I like us to warm up. <gasps> so this is where you get to pick mm-hmm. an exercise you're going to do, and then mm-hmm. I'm going to throw some rapid fire questions at you. Excellent. All right. So okay. what is your exercise? I think I'll do some push-ups. Maybe. Some push-ups. Well, it's healthy. Okay. Yeah, full body. Yeah. Okay. Just out here, fine, or yep. something like that. And and I'm just going to do them, and you'll talk to me while I'm doing them yep. or afterwards. Oh, while. Okay. Hello. Oh, oh, of course. Of course. I want to hear and, your 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 breath. Ah, uh, you're going to be able to hear me from the. From you can the take the mic right? down with you. All right. You ready? Mm-hmm. This is the sound of push-ups. <laughs> <laughs> Luca, what's your astrological sign? I'm a Pisces. What's your favorite food? That's a tough one, but pasta. What's your favorite? Who is your favorite author? Oof, another tough one. Mm-hmm. Why do you make me choose these things? Um, <laughs> mm, uh, mm, I'll go with favorite uh, fiction author, which is Salman Rushdie. All right. What's your favorite book? Oof. All these hard questions. I knew right this. Off the bat. Yeah. Mm, I'll go with my favorite nonfiction book, Debt: The First Five Thousand Years. Okay, and what's your favorite scotch? I have bourbon here, but I'll switch Mm, it to scotch. That's also another really tough one. I think Brooklady, actually, on the island of Isla. Nice form, by the way. What's your favorite smell? Mm. Hmm. I can't think and do push-ups at the same time. Yes. Um, Hmm. The smell of success. (laughs) What's your favorite chess opening? Hmm. Alakine's defense. Your favorite type of writing? Hmm. Creative writing. What's your favorite porn? (laughs) (laughs) You don't have to answer that. We're done. We're done. done. Oh my gosh. 
Was that, was that the song? question that I think you were going <laughs> to? Yes. Yes. I knew it. I knew it. No, I didn't. I was. I couldn't, guys. I couldn't figure out what ridiculous question to ask Luca because Luca is one of the nicest people you'll ever meet. And I was like, let me just throw him that. Yeah, um, exactly. What's a question that would disqualify him from public office at any point in the future? <laughs> oh, yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> Yeah, I mean, speaking of your your kindness, um, you had a birthday party once. I think it was your 28th, maybe 27th, but it was when you decided to have everybody do a roast, <laughs> yeah, which is one of right. the most ballsy things I've ever seen. But it's almost like, well, what are people going to say? <laughs> I was hoping they would say some things that were in their hearts, perhaps, but that they hadn't been given the, the platform necessarily to say in a public <laughs> format <laughs> among people who might understand. I think the worst thing that somebody said was, Luca is so nice. He's like a sociopath. <laughs> yeah. Well, I was, I was, uh, I was uh, hoping that people would be brutally honest. I should have been <laughs> a, perhaps a, a bit more uh, clear about that. I think yeah. they probably were, though. That's the oh, thing. Fair enough. I thought it was going to get hit a lot more on my lack of timeliness. I did hear a couple of things about there that. There were a few. Yeah, yeah, yeah exactly. Yeah. Eh, in general. Hmm. Yeah. Mm-hmm. It was a fun time. It was a very fun time. Yeah, I would kind of like to do that myself. and <laughs> Hopefully I won't cry towards the end of it. <laughs> there are some things I'm sure people can say. Yeah, right? yeah. <laughs> if you're out there. <laughs> um. Okay, so the name of this podcast is Bullish with Toro. So what do you think about when you hear the word bullish? Well, I squarely am placed in the, the realm of uh, Wall Street. So, mm-hmm. you know, a bullish market or... In general, the optimism of the well-off, so to speak. Sure. But, um, but yeah, in general, optimism, which is a good thing going into 2021, I think. We hope. We hope. I mean, <laughs> same time last year, everyone's. Uh, oh, oh, that's, <laughs> <laughs> ask me about my favorite porn again. <laughs> <laughs> uh, well, no, I think that's great. That that makes sense. Um, <clears throat> the definition that I've been running with is hopeful or confident that someone or something will be successful, optimistic about the future of something or someone. So that's kind of the purpose of this conversation. It's I want to get a sense of where you are today and your outlook for the future. Mm. So before we talk about all of that, let's take a little step back. I want to know about what kind of a kid were you, Luca? Mm. I know you have, you know, your sister Allegra. You were homeschooled, which I find pretty fascinating. Yes. Uh, so can you tell us a little bit about that? Yeah. Um, let's see. Open, Erie, Pennsylvania in the late 90s, so to speak. No, it would have been probably early 2000s by then when we started homeschooling and everything. Um, yeah. Uh, when when would you like to particularly start with the, I guess I'll, I'll start with the, the homeschooling perhaps. Uh, a, uh, a wonderful shot in the dark. Uh, that I think my my parents were perhaps very qualified to uh, to make being educators themselves, and uh, they decided that they would give it a shot, and I think it worked out pretty well. I mean, if I do say so myself, yeah, yeah. I mean, I at least appreciated that uh, that approach to it, and I think it's probably something that more people these days are experimenting with, whether or not they want to huh, or not. Good <laughs> yeah. point. Good point. Yeah, it's a uh, it's a new world out there, but it's I think it's a good thing to uh, the, at least some of the things that I took out of it were. Uh, a goal-based approach to learning and education and things like that, as opposed to a schedule-based approach, which or is metrics. very normal. Yeah, metrics and things like that. Although metrics, I think, are you know necessary to a certain extent. It's just that uh, the extent to which they are uniform across an entire age group, regardless of any other specifics, is that's mm-hmm. that's when it gets perhaps um, a bit less efficient mm-hmm. uh, in determining that. But yeah, I found it to be very helpful and. It was well tailored to my interests, and there was a, a nice feedback between my interests and what I was studying, and what I was studying influencing my interests and things like that. There was wide, um, how would I put this? There was, I guess, a lot of freedom to explore a lot of the things that I wanted to explore and, and fit that into the educational context, which I think is a really important thing. Also, that you know we don't, with young people, make this clear division between the things you have to learn and the things that you actually want to explore that you sort of try and combine the two or at least synthesize them at some point. You know, and like I said, the goal-based learning was the biggest part of it. The fact that you're not simply 
sitting out your time the way a lot of people, you know, in, in the world and the workplace actually do, right? They sit at work and they, they have to grind out eight hours somehow and really a lot of their work could get done in maybe two or three hours. And that was my experience with homeschooling that, you know, it's, it's all goal-based. So if you set out some goals for the day, for the week, and if you accomplish those goals ahead of time, good for you. But yeah. if you want to take more time and, you know, do other things in between and all that type of stuff before you actually finish them, that's fine too, right? That sounds nice. So yeah. what kind of stuff were you interested in? <laughs> well, uh, I was very interested in acting and chess, which were two things that I, I carried with me, uh, for sure. And um, there were other things too, like biology. It was I love biology and uh, it was it was great opportunity to get into all sorts of things. So for, for example, um, when my family and I went to visit some relatives in Puerto Rico, uh, this was during high school, I got to make a documentary about the agricultural history and current practices on the island. I got to go and interview a bunch of people. And this was sort of like a project for... Um, my for... jaws dropped. <laughs> yes. Yeah. It was really exciting. And I, I, I learned a lot. And I still actually occasionally go back to that uh, little documentary and um, watch it again and you know listen to what they have to say, because it's still very relevant. I think I mean not not the I shouldn't be tuning my own. Was, oh, my high school documentary is really relevant, but but what they, hey, what they but said. Is, it it, is. Yeah, sure. Yeah. I, I, uh, I guess what I mean to say is that a number of the the people who uh, uh, who I interviewed were saying things that are still relevant today. Mm -hmm. How long were you homeschooled? Like from what age to what age? From fifth grade through high school. Fifth grade through high school. Okay, so, so you went to college after. Yes. Yeah. Yeah which is Carnegie Mellon, which mm -hmm. is where I met Luca in the first yeah. place. I feel like there's a perception of being homeschooled, right? Where it's yes. kind of like, yes. <laughs> maybe it's like you're not socialized, you might be awkward. So here is your chance, Luca, to dispel any of those stereotypes. Why would I dispel those stereotypes? <laughs> I, uh, there's there's good there there's lots of merit to those, some of those stereotypes. <laughs> I must say, as there are to a number of other stereotypes about those who are homeschooled, uh, and I don't shy away from them. Uh, you know, I I think perhaps that there's there's a bit of a feedback loop there, right? Where you you perhaps need a certain social context to to in order to thrive. It's nothing to to disparage, but uh, but you need a certain social context. Like for for myself, I think it was a very helpful thing to. Uh, have my education and then have the friends who I hung out with and not necessarily uh, combine the two at the, at the same time in the same context of, you know, being in a, in a room of 30 of my peers and having this socialization aspect while I'm, you know, trying to learn and all that type of stuff. So it was, it was helpful for me. Uh, I certainly think I did a lot better in terms of that than I would have done. Um, in terms of being able to have conversations with people who were older than me, with adults and things like that, because sure. I was then socialized to yeah. socialized around many more adults. But of course, then that that means that I'll still have those moments like in The Queen's Gambit. Have you watched The Queen's Gambit? Yes, yes, I okay. have. <laughs> yes, I, I'm so glad. Uh, there's there's a moment in there where, where Beth is there with a bunch of uh, other kids from uh, high school and uh, some band comes on the uh, the TV and they're all like, oh, I love this song. And they all start singing along and she's just sitting there and looking around. And uh, that's that's the the homeschooling okay. experience. To a yeah, extent, in a nutshell. You may be able to play chess really well, but also you don't get the uh, the latest pop culture references and things like that. It's, you know. That's so funny you mentioned the Queen's Gambit. I was going to bring it up, too, but I mentioned it in Sharon's. Uh, <clears throat> I mentioned it in episode two because we were talking about strong women in general. So right. that was alluded to. Uh, so at Carnegie Mellon, you studied acting. Yes. Um, a four year, very intense program, very strong program. Anything you want to mention about that experience? Oh, man, so much. Mm -hmm. um, how much can we fit into? I know. <laughs> yeah. A couple bullets. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Um, well, I, I really appreciated the uh, and and even more so in retrospect, of, of course, because uh, especially when you're just entering that kind of a program, uh, you're very much still a kid. Not that we're still, you know, uh, not that we're by any means uh, out of the woods by being in the late 20s or early 30s, something like that, you know. But uh, but it's it's even more easy to appreciate in retrospect how teachers pushing us 
uh, really helped us thrive even more, even, even just by the simple fact of dumping more work on us than we thought <clears throat> we would be able to accomplish in a certain period of time, which is really helpful. That said, my experience is not everybody's experience. I, mm -hmm. I know that, uh, um, you know, it's, it's, uh, it was certainly difficult at many times and, uh, I can be perfectly frank with the, the fact that, uh, I think after freshman year, I had straight C's in all of my acting courses, which was definitely a, a, a change of pace uh, considering the fact that in, uh, in a homeschooling context, I was very much on the ball. I, I think <laughs> yeah, I would have, sure. yeah, I, yeah, it's, it's, uh, you know, I mean, I, I understand it's, it's different when people think of homeschooling as like, oh, your parents are handed out the grades and stuff like that. Well, I know it's different for everyone, but in Pennsylvania, there are actual actual inspectors who are certified to be able to inspect your work. So oh. at the end of a year, you have to carry all of this mountain of documentation and paperwork and proof that you've been working through these particular subjects. You have to take a standardized test at the end of the year to prove that you've passed through mm -hmm. a requisite uh, number and type of, you know, types of information and all that type of stuff and, and subjects. And uh, you actually sit down with this uh, inspector at the end of every year and go through all of the work that you did throughout the year, and then they'll pass you subject to subject, all that type of stuff. So it's it's not as um, willy nilly as people might think. Exactly. Yeah. yeah. There's uh, but uh, but in a, and to give the context for my my first year in in uh, Carnegie Mellon, I was attempting to take as many outside courses as possible outside of the department because oh, it's no 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 I know I know <laughs> it's really difficult well because you're at one of the best universities of the country and you and you you want to start taking courses and things that you're interested in just like I did in, in uh right. you know in high school yeah exactly when I was homeschooled and uh uh you know of, of course you have very well-intentioned administrators within the department who said uh, you're getting straight C's in your acting classes why are you interested in taking classes outside of you know, uh, outside of the department. And, uh, you know, of course, there's there's a, a difference when it comes to, uh, you know, why you get a, a C in an acting class as opposed to when you get it in perhaps another academic context, sure. you know, that it doesn't necessarily have to mean that you aren't putting in the work or that you aren't sure. finishing assignments or anything like that. It's It has to do with perhaps much more many more nebulous ideas and Yeah, context. and the criteria is so different. Yeah, yeah, yeah exactly. So um, I think I, I improved quite a bit in terms of both grades and personal <laughs> and growth uh, and artistic growth in that context. It was all very helpful, and I, I appreciate it. Even the times when there were some <laughs> professors who would gently say, perhaps directing might be something that you'd be interested in. Perhaps, I don't think they necessarily thought that I had any, any skill in directing, but perhaps wanted to at least give me another option to push me gently in a different direction. But, mm -hmm. you know, where would artists be if, if uh, we didn't have people, you know, in our, in our lives uh, pushing us every once in a while and saying, are you sure you should be doing this? Are you sure this is something that, uh, you know, you're, you're cut out for, or something that you feel you need to be doing, all that type of stuff. So. Yeah. Well, it's good to have those kind of check-ins, though, because if the answer is yes to yourself, then keep pursuing it. If the answer is no, then then pivot accordingly. Yeah. I always say that there's there's nobody who is, uh, you know, showing up at your doorstep every day saying, will you please be an artist? Please. The whole world is asking, you know, so you got to choose to re-up as, as uh, you know, as often as possible. So. I fucking love that. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> So Luca, what are you up to now? So like, what are you working on? It's a pandemic. Um, what are you working on leisurely? What are you working on occupationally? I'm, I'm glad to have those uh, two flags planted, partitions erected, however you would, you would want to put it between occupational work and uh, personal projects mm -hmm. and perhaps even, even a more uh, broad uh, context of uh, what is you know one's time and energy being being uh, really invested in, but uh, I think well occupationally it's sort of like a like a hodgepodge. I'm uh, I'm in transition to uh, um, some copywriting work, and uh, for example, I'm I'm in the middle of a of a training course for a uh, particular certification for this one company who's work I may be able to do once I take the the training course. I'm not allowed to talk a lot about it because of okay. NDAs and all that stuff. But, um, but uh, so that's that's exciting. And um, uh, and as I mentioned before, I'm doing a, a handful of uh, adults lessons and things like that. You'd be surprised at how popular chess has become after the Queen's Gambits. You know, mm -hmm. it's, uh, that stuff type of stuff uh, pops up. And I've been very, very lucky, especially because, you know, I love teaching adults and especially adults from scratch and stuff like that. And I just love the game of chess. So it's, it's great to do that. Um, it's been nice to recently 
in a less occupational context, just work on my own chess betterment, my, my own training regimen and try and improve myself. I went back and forth on its, its real purpose during the whole pandemic because I thought, what, what am I doing? I mean, it's a game and, you know, there are many more important things I can invest my time in and I did invest my time in too. But uh, I thought, what place does this have for in my life during a, you know, a, a context like this? And then I realized a little bit more recently that actually I, I feel as if I am a, a sharper person in general when I do a lot of personal work like chess work specifically, yeah. you know, and that's, and that's been a lot of, a lot of the, uh, uh, focus that I've been taking as well. I shouldn't say too much proportionally, but a little bit of focus to try and set time aside for personal chess work and for a little bit of language studying, you know, more meditation, journaling, stuff like that, you know. That's cool. You mentioned that, um, for me with, when you say that chest kind of, it basically exercises a different muscle in your brain. I remember when I was studying for the GMAT, it was just like, whoa, mm. I'm I'm back in school. Oh, I have yeah. to memorize these moves, if you will, in terms yeah. of math and stuff. So I, I totally understand that you feel like a sharper person by doing these kind of activities. Yeah. I also, uh, I, I found it to be incredibly useful. A lot of the, the, the training and work that I had already done uh, in the, the years and years uh, previous uh, to be very helpful for understanding what was happening in the country in certain ways it, through, through um, how would I put it, through analogous uh, ideas in chess and strategies in chess and things like that. Because it's, it's a more, um, how would I put it, it's, it's basically a, uh, a log of decision making in a uh, spatial context, you know. And so there's mm-hmm. a lot that comes up in the realm of decision making, there's a lot that comes up in the realm of psychology and in logic and all that type of stuff. So, uh, for example, the the idea of um, precautions and prophylactic action and things like that that has this year been perhaps a focal point of uh, you know our, our understanding of what we need to do as individuals in a society and all that type of stuff. And there was especially a lot in the early stages uh, of the pandemic of people saying, why are we implementing these precautionary measures? It's, it seems mm-hmm. so overblown. Uh, I don't see the pandemic really happening. So why are we you know, reacting to it in this way? And it was very helpful to come at it from a chess perspective and, and remember that uh, you know, precautionary measures are there uh, because nothing is happening right now that is immediate in, in its sure. context. That by the time you reach a situation where you're looking around and you're saying, "Wow, there's there's a lot of this danger around," it's too late for precautionary right, measures. Yeah. You know, that's you you uh, you implement them when you don't see it around you, so that it never arises. And ideally, you never know that it works because the situation that you're trying to prevent against doesn't occur because right. of the prophylactic measures. So. That's awesome. So are those the kind of analogies and stories you use when teaching adults? Because I imagine when you're teaching children, you're probably not using those kind of examples. No. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. This is is also one of the one of the reasons why I um I love to teach adults. Adults are of course a different beast to uh, to work with because they uh they actually have a little less patience uh oftentimes than kids do uh, at times. I I can't say that across the board because I I actually have a number of very dedicated and very patient uh, adult students that are that are really wonderful, but. Um, but yes, certainly there's a different language that I can use with, uh, with adults to be able to, uh, convey certain ideas. And there are just certain ideas that are conveyable with adults that perhaps aren't with, with kids. Um, but, uh, it's, it's very fun to be able to parse through these types of ideas with them. I want to do something a little unorthodox for this podcast, but we have a chess set right here. We do. (laughs) Could we do like a couple of moves? Sure. Well, uh, in what uh, uh, or with what intent, so to speak? Or what's what's the the focus? That what's the what would you like out of it? I want to see how you would show me how to play chess. Oh well, this is this is a big thing. Okay. So, <laughs> <laughs> okay. Well, there there are a couple of different ways to to go about this because um, I'll I'll put it this way: um, when you're learning a game like chess. Uh, it's a bit like learning a new language in that you're when you first start out, you learn how to pronounce things. You learn how to say pretty simple sentences like, I want this, I go there, I do that, that type of thing. 
Um, you know, and, and if you piece those together into a, a conversation, usually the conversation has very well-defined boundaries and, uh, you know, it's ordering coffee at a cafe. Sounds like programming. Or asking for directions. Yeah, yeah, yeah. exactly. It's, it's very, very well-defined. And uh, so you can have those types of conversations with the language that you have, but you can't, say, discuss independent cinema or something like that. Have that type of a wide-ranging... Understood. Uh, you know, but, uh, but over time, you do learn to how to, you know, by increasing your vocabulary and your usage, all that type of stuff, you can have those conversations. But then there are also other things that you can still gain out of it beyond that point where, um, you know, finally you're having those conversations about in independent cinema, but, uh, you know, maybe you still have yet to pick up on some other things that are perhaps some might call substrate independent uh, with of the language. Things like uh, qualities like uh, tone or irony or, you know, surprise and all, the, all that type substrate of stuff. Substrate independence. And substrate independence. Yeah, mm -hmm. exactly. I, I'm borrowing I learn something every day, y'all. <laughs> you know, I'm borrowing a term that is that is not at all uh, it, within the context of language <laughs> or chess or anything like that. It's, it's a it's a physics uh, term, but... Um, okay, well, fuck it. I want to just make a couple of moves and let's see what you say about it. Yeah, 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 yeah sure. Okay. <laughs> okay, so here's how I like to open in general. Oh, well, here, uh, first, uh, I'll, oh. I'll first <laughs> I, I'm so sorry, but uh, in the, the mid-19th century, the uh, the rules were standardized in a way that uh, one side always ended up going first. It was, you know... Oh, and what side is that? Oh, uh, well, it's it's the side that you would you would think would, uh, <laughs> would choose in the mid-19th century to, to move first, you know, despite the fact that... White. Side. Despite the fact that uh, at the time it was not white and black pieces, it was white and red pieces actually, because of the dyes of the time, it was Ooh. more common to make the black pieces in a red dye. Black pieces came along a little bit, you know, further on. Not that there haven't been throughout history a number of of chess sets that have come in various colors for both sides and various designs, all that type of stuff. It has this very storied history, you know, going back about four. Guys, centuries. this is why I love Luca. Yeah. <laughs> it's, it's, I love. You combine the homeschooling and the chess <laughs> and you get this. <laughs> okay, okay. So you should yeah, go yeah. first then. Sure. Well, I'll start with one of the, the most common and uh, one of the strongest and one of the oldest openings uh, in the game, which is moving the pawn in front of the king two squares up. It's called the king's pawn opening or E4 in uh, algebraic notation or where you put it. Wonderful. Uh, you have chosen to play C6, uh, which is, I say that in algebraic notation, which is the uh, shorthand language of the game, both written and oral, uh, which for, for those of you who uh, aren't familiar with it, this is an opening, or at least the first move of an opening called the Karo Khan. Um, most openings have some sort of a name and of course a storied history behind them because they are played, you know, not too infrequently and therefore a bunch of theory builds up around them about how to play them, you know, how best to counter them. Sure. And then depending on the strength of the opening, if it's a really strong opening and it works really well, then people come up with even better ways to try and counter it because, you know, people play it more often, people have to find a way to counter it. And then of course, if you find a really good way to counter it, then the people who originally play that then have to find a way to counter the counter. And so this is how you build a whole arsenal of theory surrounding a very good opening, like, you know, the Karakhan or the French defense or the Sicilian defense or a number of different openings that have been played for a very long time over history. You know, this one, I don't know exactly how long the Karakhan has been played, but there are a lot of other ones like the Sicilian defense, which I mentioned, which has been played for hundreds of years. And, you know, the Rui Lopez, which has been played for a good half millennium too. You know, it's, it's, uh, yeah, it's a lot of, a lot of theory that goes into it since then. All right, let's do a couple more. Yeah. Well, this is one of the, the book moves, uh, in, uh, responding to this. Well, watch this. Oh, and that's the book move too. Nice. Sweet. <laughs> Sweet. So, so I just went uh, pawn to d5. That's right. Yeah. So I play d4, you play d5. Uh, there are a number of responses that could uh, come out of this. I could play knight c3. I could play e5. I could even capture. Uh, it all depends on... But will you capture? That's what I kind of set up there. Oh, well, 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 mm -hmm. yeah. It all depends on what kind of a game I want to have. Do I want to have a more closed game? Do I want to have a more open game? You know, more more positional, more tactical, all that type of stuff. So this um, is fun. Yeah, okay, okay, well, let's not go down too deep because I think I'm going to want to finish. But yeah, folks, yeah. listen to this. If you want some chess lessons, hey. Luke is your guy. That's right. DM me, as they say. As the kids say. <laughs> all right. So you are writing. What kind of writing are you doing? Mm, that uh, That's also a, a bit of a, well, a, a number of uh, a number of different little projects and things like that, that I'm, I'm trying to uh, keep up a little bit of creative writing, a little bit of journaling and things like that, but that's much more personal. Um, what, what we used to do in Brooklyn is you, 
Luca used to have these writer symposiums mm -hmm. once a month or once every couple of weeks or so. Yeah, every month or so we'd try to have a symposium, yeah. And so this was a space where um, you could bring different poems you're writing, chapters of books, have them read, and then have an audience that will respond and give you feedback in a safe space. And there's always wine and food. So I was there each time. Um, I'm not a writer, but I, I always wanted to be there. I love being around creatives. That's why I have a minor from Purnell at Carnegie Mellon. Um, so I would always write haikus. And then it was kind of fun because it became like a warm up that we would do. Yeah. I'd come with a haiku and a theme. Um, actually, I write haikus in my, my hot sheets at work now every <laughs> nice. once in a while. <laughs> Just very like nice. have some creativity throughout the day you mm -hmm. know, as a project manager. Very, very nice. Um, but yeah, yeah, so like you, you are a really good writer, Luca. You've got well, like, you. you're, you're really good with language. So well, thank you. are you writing like short stories or just like free form? Yeah, a little bit of short story work, a little bit of, uh, yeah, a little bit of free form work, uh, just whatever I'm thinking about and trying to write a number of um, political articles that are at the moment mostly for my own edification. Uh, it's, you know, and to, to still me against uh, Twitter rants or things like that, sure. that I might ordinarily be uh, predisposed to, <laughs> things like that. Uh, especially after everything that has happened over the course of this year and feeling very responsible as an artist for paying attention and trying to record everything that's uh, that's going on, at least as much as I can consume. And it's dovetailed very well for a long time with the fact that I was just a news junkie and, and mm -hmm. pulling in lots and lot, as much information as I possibly could. Uh, and of course, this time period has allowed for that, being able to just dive into uh, a particular area of inquiry and and do that without much uh, impediment and uh, so it's it's been very mm, what's the what's the word I would want to want to use um, well I've I found it satisfying to be able to write political articles for my own edification and things like that and and not necessarily have to to share them but to, to at least aid me in developing. Uh, you know, more complex points of views on everything that's that's happening in the world right now, and especially in the United States, and especially, like I said, as an artist, to to try and uh, develop a multitude of perspectives, so that uh, going into the the work that I think we all have to do is in in society, but especially as artists, I'm more equipped to understand, you know, the the audiences in in their all of their glorious variety uh, that uh, you know artists have a certain social responsibility to be in conversation with. Yeah, I think that's super important to discuss what's going on and to have the information to do so coherently. Uh, well so yeah, uh, the pandemic has definitely given us the the time and you could say the focus, right? Just by the, the constraints that we have in our movement to kind of re-figure out what our priorities are, how we want to best use our time. But I just want to let everybody know that before the pandemic, Luca and I <laughs> and two of our friends had well, my, my girlfriend and and another friend of, of ours. Yeah. Of her, yeah. So two of my friends, one of Luca's girlfriends. Wait. <laughs> no, this is <laughs> start that over. <laughs> my gosh. Uh, we went the, to carnival in Brazil. Yes, that's right. The, the 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 four of us went to carnival in Brazil. It's true. During the time, if if anyone knows what around what time of year carnival happens, uh, or carnival happens in uh, Brazil, uh, they'll know that it, if the, you sync up that timeline, it was around the beginning of the pandemic before any level of government was really acknowledging that we were in the middle of a pandemic or yeah. that, uh, yeah, the pandemic was at our shores or spread globally or anything like that. I think it was when I was leaving my flight back to New York that I heard there was one case found in Brazil. So mm. yeah, <laughs> but that was such a good time. Like what a way to go out before Oof. the isolation. Yeah. That was, that was a, a, a once in a lifetime experience Yeah, that Absolutely. we're going to do again. Yes, that we will do again. Once upon a time, yeah. Yeah, it's, at, at some, some point, point in the future, exactly. At some point in the future, when it's when it's safe again. I want those same VIP tickets. <laughs> it's a VIP. Yeah, no, exactly. It's incredible to be able to uh, experience in that, not just the the energy in in uh, in the country and particularly in in Rio, but to uh, uh, see the performances that each of the samba schools. Flavellas, oh my god! Exactly. They each they they work so. To, and and again, this is something that um, I think. Uh, my girlfriend is probably much, much better. I not probably. She is uh, much, much better uh, positioned to speak uh, about this. She's mm -hmm. Brazilian, mm -hmm. so 
uh, uh, but the the amount of work that goes into that throughout the entire year leading up to it, in terms of the costumes, in terms of the choreography, in terms oh. of the stories that are being told, it's moving. Stuff, it's, it's yeah, it's beautiful. incredibly moving, and it and it goes on all night for nights on end, multiple nights on end. It's an incredible experience, and uh, I I still am yeah just uh, amazed. It's you know even even beyond the the, uh, the the partying and everything, which is amazing. You know it's it's incredible, <laughs> but it's but it's an incredible social event. You know, yeah. uh, like a a cultural event. Uh, yeah. You know. Okay, so here is the question of the podcast, mm. and I think it'll be it'll be a fine segue from what we were kind of just talking about. Mm-hmm. Um, and it is Luca. Are you doing what you want to be doing with your life? Yes. Yay! The first yes! Oh, really? The first yes! yes. Oh, that's, <laughs> that's good to hear. Awesome. So how yeah. did you manage that? Um, well, I, I guess uh, I should probably elaborate on perhaps the, the parameters of the question were, uh, fortunately, I think both broad enough and narrow enough to, to be able to, for me to say yes in this context, because... Uh, to pull it back into a chess context, uh, for example, I feel as if I can be doing what I want to be doing with my life without being at some storied future end point that I have set out for myself that is is a, um, a, a plateau of achievement, so to speak, beyond which I will be satisfied or w- I will have done what I want with my life. And I, I know, especially as, as an actor, I can't speak for other types of artists, but as an actor, we're constantly uh, talking in terms of states, in terms of static states, so to speak, of somebody having made it, you know, having reached that plateau or, you know, uh, or, or for example, you know, being present as, a, mm-hmm. as an actor or something like that. We always talk about like getting into it, like finding that state of being present when really it's uh, presence isn't a state, it's a journey, right? You know, you're, mm. you're moving through the world and at every moment that you are in the world, that is presence, right? That is, that is you present in society. So, and, and the way that you talk about it matters quite a lot because if you're, if you're so consumed with trying to get into that state of being present and, you know, that's the sweet spot that everybody talks about, then how do you know when you're in it? And once you're actually in it, you're constantly questioning, is this it? Am I in that mode? And by that time, obviously actual presence has long passed you Mm -hmm, by and you're, mm -hmm. you're missing all sorts of cues and information in your environment. You know, this could either be in the context of a scene that you're in as an actor, or it could be just in life, you know? Um, so that's the context that I feel I'm in. Like with, I was going to talk about uh, it in the context of chess, that uh, you can be at a certain point in terms of the development of the game, in terms of the progress of the game, and say that you're right on track, you know, you're right where you want to be and still not be there. You're not at the the culmination of the game or the culmination of your plans. And even once you reach there, even once you finish the end of the game and you, you know, checkmate your opponent or the, or the game somehow ends, it doesn't mean that you say, okay, well, I, I won the game, I checkmated him, I'm never going to play chess again because I achieved everything that I wanted sure, to do. You yeah. jump right back in, you play another game. And it's that's the, the way I think it is with, with life in many ways. That's dope. Okay. Mm-hmm. Well, that's all, folks. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay. <laughs> no, that's cool. Is there anything else that you're, that you're doing in terms of setting yourself up for, let's say, a post-COVID world? Yeah, that's... Uh, that's that's a big one because we don't exactly know what a post COVID world uh, looks like. So yeah, or you know, when you, it begins. Yes, yeah, yeah, exactly. So I I think there are a lot of I think a lot of people are already doing that in small ways in terms of taking care of their health and setting themselves up on in schedules and with habits that are uh, focused on self improvement and self betterment and all that type of stuff because I think people have realized that those types of things are the only things that they can really control. At the end of the day, we learned a lot about that over the, the course of this year of what you can and can't control in the world. And uh, so, yes, getting a better and better hold, I think, on a number of those types of things and and uh, focused on self-betterment and, and stuff like that. But uh, in terms of broader ambitions, uh, I think it's, it's hard to just, uh, for me at least, to say, I want to achieve this right now when I don't know the context in which I'm going to be achieving whatever that would be, Hmm. if that makes any sense. Yeah. So you're kind of just a chill dude. Yeah. I mean, I I think it's okay to wait to make bold plans until you you have an understanding of the ground beneath you, you know, so Mm -hmm. to speak. Uh, And I think, I mean, perhaps to bring it back to being bullish, uh, that um, 
uh, in the, the context, at least, of markets and the future and what will happen that you, you can clearly see, because, I mean, it, the stock market is essentially just an entire, you know, confidence metric, essentially, on the, on the rest of the world uh, or on, on the state of the world that you can see that um, uh, the people who are within that, that context are not going to make any uh, bold, confident projections about the future without knowing sort of where they stand, mm -hmm. where things stand in the present, you know, and you need to have a good understanding of the same thing in, in many different areas. But that's sort of where I'm standing in a non-financial context. Mm -hmm. hmm. I dig that. Okay. Huh. All right, well, Luca. Thank you. Yeah, yeah. I think that that's completely reasonable to say that you want to have solid footing before you just, you know, jump. Um, that could speak to your personality type. Others, you know, yeah. operate a certain way, but that's why I want to talk to different people on this yeah, podcast. Yeah, I want yeah, to yeah. understand like yeah. everyone's state of being and their yeah. vibe. And to, to put it in just one last uh, chess analogy, for example, uh, that there there are so many moments. One of the, one of the things that I think is exciting about uh, about the decision making in the game is that you never know at any one moment uh, whether or not you should, uh, for example, just make a natural move, a small improvement or adjustment or calculate deeply in a, uh, in a critical situation about the, the exact nature of what's going to play out in a certain situation, or, you know, the, these, these general directions uh, to go in, whether or not you should go for the kill right out, or whether or not you should uh, build up a, a slower and, and more solid approach to, uh, you know, undermining this particular structure or, uh, you know, building up this or that, that, that type of stuff. And I think uh, in this particular context that we're in, I'm more in the mode of uh, making small improvements at the moment, mm -hmm. making small adjustments within uh, within the situation because we don't necessarily know what shape or what form the rest of the game will take. And until mm -hmm. then, it's always a good idea just to make those smaller improvements. Yeah. Thank you, Luca, for joining me today. Uh, is there anything me. that you want to share before we sign off? Yeah, um, in the context of, of making uh, improvements in the world that we're living in, uh, especially for anyone who's living in New York at this time, uh, a, uh, a friend of, of ours and a fellow Carnegie Mellon uh, graduate who is uh, an amazing person is running for a city council in the uh, 6th District, uh, New York City. Uh, his name is Jeffrey Amura. Uh, he is an incredible person. He, I can't think of anyone who would be, uh, you know, better suited for this uh, for this role. And uh, one of the one of the most incredible things I think about his candidacy is that uh, he is championing an arts centered recovery and uh, and build back for the for the city. And if wow. you look at the the plans that he's uh, you know proposing. Uh, I think they're they're all incredibly smart and uh, it absolutely the types of things that if you're if you're an artist in in New York or if you're somebody who uh, when they think of New York thinks of the arts and and the culture that makes it what it is you know he's your candidate to to support and uh, especially if you're an artist in the in the cities uh, so he's uh, Jeffrey Amura is his name and he's running for city council in uh, the sixth district district and uh, you can like you know give a, I don't know if it's, should I say this type of thing about donating to sure. his campaign? Of I course. think it's, that's probably the right context or, or helping out in any way that you can spreading the word about it because, uh, you know, especially now in this, in this, uh, context, uh, artists all around the country. And, and of, of course, most, especially for those of us in New York, uh, we need a, a champion who we can, mm. uh, who we can really, uh, get behind and that is absolutely Jeffrey's. And where can people find you, Luca, if they want to do chess lessons or just see what you're up to? Oh, well, I'm I'm on Instagram. Uh, you know, my we'll probably be sharing this uh, this episode, so you'll hopefully you know by by way of of uh, you know Toro find me. Uh, but uh, but if not, my handle is just my full name, Luca Glinsky, uh, which is L U K A G L I N S K Y, and. That's the that's the whole ball game. I mean, if you want other information, you know, you know, just uh, DM me and I can give you my email address, my social security, <laughs> and, you know, the whole deal. All right. Well, thanks everyone. Um, see you next time. Bye. Bye. For more about Jeffrey Omura for City Council District Six, check out jeffreyomura.com. That's O M U R A. Primaries are on June twenty second. So. Are you one to make small improvements? 
or maybe you're one to dive in completely. Either way, keep leveling up. And remember, representation matters. Stay safe, stay woke, and happy Martin Luther King Jr. Day. Until next time. It's Bullish with Toro.